You're listening to Connect on blogtalkradio.com. Catch us on the web at umconnect.info. Well, welcome to this new episode of Connect. I'm Michael Rich, and I'm the Western North Carolina Conference Communications and Web Manager. And our guest this morning is Sally Queen. She's the Associate Director of Ministry Services for the Western North Carolina Conference. She grew up in Silva, North Carolina, went to Meredith College, went to Duke, and then has been serving the conference since then. So today we're going to learn more about Sally and her work with the conference staff. So Sally, welcome to the show. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. So we're going to go back to the beginning. Um, And we have some ties because I live up in Western North Carolina. You grew up in uh, Jackson County in Silva. And uh, so what was church life like back then? So my family and I worshiped at Cullowee United Methodist Church on the campus of Western Carolina University. And that's where I grew up from the time I was two uh, until I went away to college. And it was a wonderful place to grow up. Uh, one, lots of great Sunday school stories that I could share about times of learning to sing Jesus Loves Me and uh, going to worship, going to Camp Tacoa in the summer with the children from my church, participating in the youth group. And we had a connection, and I didn't know that this morning. You were confirmed by John Boggs. Was, Absolutely. He was one of our guests a couple of weeks ago, and uh, and then he came to be my boss. So you were uh, 13 when I was uh, his associate at Long's Chapel. There you go. So tell us about your call story. How did How did you hear the call to ministry? So I would say that the first person who identified a call in me was my youth minister. And Ms. Davis told me that I was going to go um, and preach one day. And I proceeded to tell Ms. Davis that would not happen <laughs> and that I would be happy to serve in the church in any capacity, but I would not be in pastoral ministry. So I continued on to Meredith College pursuing my plan, was majoring and did major in biology, uh, but continued to be active in the life of the church. and. Probably what was transformative was getting to plan and lead youth events. And there was something different that would happen for me in planning and leading those youth events. I would plan and lead lessons to go teach in a middle school classroom in the same kind of way, but I didn't feel the passion inside. So I started to wonder what it was that was kind of working in me and what was that feeling. And as I continued to explore that and, and sought out some guidance from other people. Finally, uh, on a mission trip my junior year in college, I was had worked all week in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, hammering and tearing down things and uh, working with the people in Atlanta and standing there holding hands with my friends and praying at the end of that time, my chest literally started beating hmm. and, and my heart was just pounding. And I believe the Holy Spirit was finally nudging me to say, all right, God, I've got it. I'm done with Sally's way, and I'll answer and follow your call. So Sally's plan was to become a teacher? Was that... I was going to teach middle school science, yes. So well, continued on with that biology degree, but it led me straight to Duke Divinity School. And that certainly prepared you. All that biology and science got you ready for theology. Is Absolutely. It... I have found many ways, though, to in- integrate my science knowledge into sermons as we talk about the body of Christ and thinking about how our, our physical bodies work and um, have used mitochondria even as an example in a sermon. Well, there you go. Um, it is a good use. It, it is fascinating. Uh, you know, I actually was you know, one of those few students that was at Duke that uh, um, I studied religion and philosophy knowing that I was going to divinity school. And when I got to divinity school, I was bored. Mm. So it was interesting that uh, people coming with accounting degrees in biology actually were excited about getting in the classroom and learning all this stuff. I don't know, Mike. I, I was a little terrified. I didn't know the theological language, and my theological dictionary was my best friend that first semester. I understand. Eschatological was not a scientific term that I knew. That is true. But you could have pulled out a few scientific I terms. I could have. Yes. So, you, uh, you finished at Duke what year? I graduated Duke in 2003. And then you went into local parish work. I did. I was the associate at Aldersgate in Shelby okay. for about five and a half years and then served at Abernathy Memorial in Rutherford College before coming on conference staff. Okay. So um, you had several years 
uh, in local parishes. Tell us, tell us some of those fun stories. Now, I, I used to live in Cleveland County. I was at uh, Camp Loy White and then at the Bellwood Charge uh, for a little while. But uh, so I know that whole Cleveland County area. Tell, tell me some stories about your first days in ministry. What was that like? So when I first found out I was going to Shelby, uh, and the people there know this story, so I'm not hurting anybody's feelings, <laughs> but they knew that I had always kind of thought of Shelby as being the armpit of North Carolina. I mean, when you think of geography, it's right there in the middle. And so I was first a little alarmed about going to the armpit, but I quickly grew to love the people of Cleveland County. Um, some of my favorite times there were we engaged with a, re a relationship with a school that was just across the street from Aldersgate, Graham Elementary. Mm -hmm. I had a lunch buddy there. His name was Rashawn. Rashawn graduated last year from high school. Uh, so, I, so that's some of my favorite times were, were being involved there at the school and helping to lead the church in a ministry at Christmas time, which made sure that the children and the families there at that school were provided for at Christmas. Um, and then I had a wonderful experience with Jeff Patterson, was the senior pastor there. Jeff is one of our district superintendents now, and he was a great mentor for me and, and really formative in my early years of under appointment. Yeah, five and a half years as an associate, that's a long time. Yeah. So then you moved to Rutherford College, which is uh, one of those little out-of-the-way places, you have to want to go to Rutherford College. This is very true. In fact, I had driven up and down I-40 from Cullowee uh, to Raleigh and Durham for about eight years and had always seen the sign for Valdez and Rutherford College but had never visited there. Uh, Rutherford College has some strong roots to the United Methodist Church. Right. Um, Rutherford College in and of itself was later a part of Brevard. Uh, so they have a lot of history with, with the United Methodist Church. I right. served a beautiful rock church uh, that's right there on Malcolm Boulevard. Folks use that road to cut through on their way up to Lenore and mm -hmm. on to Boone. Um, it was a, a, a years of learning and growing, and uh, the church had a food pantry, and that was some of my favorite opportunities there was engaging with the community. Yeah, it was, I guess, about uh, two springs ago, my wife and I decided she'd always heard of this Valdez place. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, let's go. And I hadn't been there in 20 years. And so we went and did the whole tourist thing with the Waldensian Christians. Right. And I, I found that to be, you know, one of the more interesting uh, things in North Carolina. It's one of those hit away uh, things that you can do, but you can learn a lot of history and learn a lot about uh the church. So um, you've gone from Valdez to here. When did that happen? We moved to Gastonia and I came on conference staff in 2012. Okay. And that was quite a transition leaving the local church. Uh, I had never really saw myself outside of the local church. Mm -hmm. My call was very much um, defined to what it meant to be a pastor in a local church. So it stretched me in ways, uh, but, but it was an exciting opportunity to come on staff here. Well, so tell me, um, what was it like those first days in the job? Because I think you're the first person to ever be the Associate Director of uh, Ministerial that, Services. That is true. I, th this is a new position that the conference started, sort of realizing that there was a need to focus particularly on candidacy mm -hmm. and folks who were exploring and, and discerning a call into ministry. And so I came here uh, six months pregnant. Oh, wow. And so my first uh, couple of weeks and months and days were filled with many, many transitions, a new job, a new place to live, and a third child on the way. Um, so Kim Ingram and I began to sit down and talk and dream and vision of the kinds of needs that were, were out there that had been identified. And we've really transformed lots of opportunities into a, a full job um, that has been really uh, challenging and life-giving for the last three years. So tell me a little bit about this job. What what does it entail? Sure. So uh, much of it is spent working with folks who are exploring and discerning a call into ministry. So whether that be folks who have uh, are ready to enter into our candidacy process, and over the last three years we've totally revamped that process. Folks no longer receive a one-on-one -on -one mentor to walk through candidacy. They do that in a group setting where they have the chance to reflect with two mentors and about six or eight other candidates who are also exploring their call to ministry. One of the exciting things that we've experienced there is one candidate shares a story and another candidate begins to realize that that's how God is speaking to them as well. Mm -hmm. And they begin to hear connections about what God's doing in their own lives through engaging with their brothers and sisters. 
So candidacy has been a big part of this job. And then we have also reached out and, and tried to think of new and creative ways to help people who might be early, early, early in their stage of responding to God's call and realizing that many people in different places and times and ways um, have a call, and we want to help them to explore and discern that call. Very neat. Now, I know that things have changed. I came in through, uh, you know, the board when, you know, we're, you were still ordained a deacon. Right. Uh, and then, you know, that was our probationary status. And, and then you went on to elder. And, of course, that's no longer the language. But uh, things changed in the 2012 discipline as well. So uh, you came in in the midst of transition, not only a new job, but right. a new discipline with some you know, new ways of uh, talking about ministry and things sure. like that. And also, you know, the, the Board of Ordained Ministry was in the process of sort of mm -hmm. changing their structure and, and offering a new interviewing process, and I've had the opportunity to be a part of that. Um, I think one of the really exciting things that we're doing for people from can the candidacy level on through their ordination um, is trying to really be intentional about learning who the people are and who, who it is that God has created and called them to be, what their gifts are, what their strengths are, uh, the areas that they want to grow in, and allowing them to live into that calling and supporting them in that. So how many candidates do we have now in the process right now? We tend to have about 30 candidates who participate in a retreat. We have two retreats a year, so about 60 candidates who are discerning a call into ministry in a yearly basis. Many of those candidates uh, go right into seminary. Uh, we probably have close to 85 to 90 seminary students. Uh, some of those candidates uh, are interested in becoming a local pastor, and so they go on to licensing school, and then they become clergy. Uh, so our, it's really hard to give a good estimate right. of candidates because those numbers are fluctuating all of the time. But we've consistently had about 30 different people who've participated in a retreat to begin their process. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, you know, very interesting uh, to be serving in a church. It is not necessary to go on straight to seminary and, and out. You know, that was how we were told in right. the old days. Um, anymore, there are so many opportunities and, and ways to to go through the process. And, right. and I think that that is an important part of um, what you and Kim do, is that you make it possible um, to see the whole breadth. And we just didn't have that 25 years ago when I was coming through the board. Right. Well, and, and we certainly want to be hospitable and in relationships with those candidates so that they get their questions answered and so that this big process of licensed or ordained ministry is as clear as we possibly can make it. And uh, Kim laughs when I say this all the time. If you have a question, please call and ask us. We would rather answer your question than you receive the information from somebody else. So call us, email us, don't ever guess or rely on false information. Oh. And there is, I'm certain, a lot of false information out lots there. Lots of false information and lots of questions. So we respond to lots of emails and phone calls. Oh, excellent. Well, I think we're going to take a break. After the break, we're going to come back and talk about some of the new things that you're doing, some of the, uh, the new opportunities that have just come down the pike. And um, we'll get more specific uh, after this break. So here is a word from Jennifer Davis, our Director of Discipleship Ministry. It's an exciting time to be in the Western North Carolina Conference as we develop missional networks, mission churches, go about intentional faith development, having conversations around difficult subjects, all for the purpose of creating congregations and churches who become the hands and feet of Jesus in our communities. We are all about following Jesus, making disciples, and changing the world right where God plants us. The United Methodist Foundation of Western North Carolina is a ministry of the church for the church whose mission is to build the church for generations to come. We fulfill this vision by investing in people as well as helping churches and related institutions invest the financial resources that God has given to them. My name is David Snipes and we look forward to the day when you give your United Methodist Foundation a call. And you can find out more about the United Methodist Foundation of Western North Carolina at the sponsor page on our show's website, which is umconnect.info. And I wanted to say that uh, 
Uh, we're also uh, recording this uh, on video today. It will be on YouTube later. So not only will you be able to listen uh, to this show, you'll be able to watch it as well. So this is the very first, and we figured Sally Queen would be perfect for that. <laughs> Sally Queen always takes new opportunities. That's right. So we're back. We're going to continue with our discussion about your ministry and your work here with the conference staff. So uh, let's get some uh, specifics here. Uh, let's focus on some of the new grants and opportunities for young adults and youth that you guys have created in the last year or so. Uh, what are these programs? How do they happen and how are they funded, et cetera? Sure. So the 2012 General Conference um, offered about $7 million for the development of young clergy through the Young Clergy Initiative. And so we had the opportunity to apply for grants. And I helped to initiate a, a, an application process here in Western North Carolina where we had a number of folks who had different dreams and ideas about recruitment and about um, supporting folks who were exploring calls into ministry. A couple of those came out of our office and many of them came out of campus ministries across the, the annual conference and some other avenues. Uh, we were really fortunate to get a couple of the grants. Uh, one that is has happened now twice is called IDK. It's a youth event for youth who are middle school or high school youth who are exploring a call into ministry. Mm. And for a day, they come together and hear many different call stories from people who, from laity who are faithfully living out their call to ministry, uh, to deacons and elders who are faithfully living out their call, local pastors, just a lot of different ways that, that people are engaging both inside and outside the local church. And the youth get to hear those stories and begin to question and think about their own callings. They have the opportunity to take a spiritual gifts assessment, and then they spend some time with a mentor that they've brought to their church from their church, uh, looking at what their gifts are, and the mentor kind of helping speak some wisdom into their lives and and helping them begin to to think about what it is that God might be calling them to do. Uh, and then another grant that we've received is for Explore which is a summer college internship program. Again, this is our second year kind of living into that grant. We had five interns last summer who received a, a scholarship stipend for the summer and worked in our local congregations for 10 weeks. We are in the process. We've just received nine applicants for the summer. We'll be choosing five of them to serve as Explorer interns. And those folks will be placed in local congregations where they get 10 weeks of really hitting the ground running of what it's like to be in full-time ministry. Very cool. And the IDK program, I just found out this morning, as you did, that uh, you made national news with the New Scope magazine that That's comes great. out. And so uh, thanks to Jim Parsons for writing that up. And uh, we had put it in uh, the news, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I'd sent it on to News Scope and United Methodist News Service and others, and they picked it up. It only took them a few weeks to get it out there. That's all right. But, um, yeah, we are doing some uh, very creative and new things within our conference, uh, and it's great when it's recognized. Mm -hmm. um, so... Uh, I remember putting out the Explore information. Mm -hmm. So you got nine applications. Nine, nine applications. Um, interestingly, they're, they're, some are from some community colleges. Some are from uh, some of our campus ministries uh, that are, are close by. Uh, we actually have two students who applied from out of state that must have somehow wow. picked up and engaged the information somehow. But I'm really excited. We'll be starting an interview process next week to uh, decide the five folks who will get to participate in the summer. Well, and very neat. They'll begin at the end of May. Okay. And it's and the five organizations, they're already chosen that will be taking? We're in the process of lining up that as well and, and trying to, we were waiting to see what kind of interest the students had, the kind of things they'd really like to explore. Hmm. We had several this summer who wanted to explore rural ministry. Wow. And I feel like in Western North Carolina, we can offer that. A Lots couple of opportunity. That, that uh, have some gifts in music. So perhaps if they're chosen, we've got some fantastic uh, folks in music ministry in our conference that we can pair them up with. So it'll be exciting to see where it goes. Yeah, that's exciting. So how, how, do, how does the funding look for the future of these? Uh, will you be able to do Explore for another year? Well, we're hopeful that there's ways that we can stretch and, and 
tweak the board budget in order to continue to implement some of these great programs. Uh, one example, a, a student who participated in Explore last summer is now going to begin her candidacy process perhaps oh, wow. this summer. So it is definitely something that the fruits are, are being evidenced in that giving someone an opportunity to explore really helps them discern that, yes, God is calling them into ordained ministry. And then others, God's calling them to, to be teachers and, and to do other things, but will be able to live out their calling in that way as well. Right. So hopefully we can find the, the resources to continue the program. And from my own experience, uh, where I discovered that I wanted to do ministry, I was all of 17. I just had gotten out of high school, and there was a little church that... Uh, said, hey, we need someone to work with our children this summer. Will you come and do this for $50 a week and all the fried chicken you want to eat? <laughs> and I said, okay. And I enjoyed doing that. And I ended up uh, going to school. I had planned to be a veterinarian. And uh, uh, I ended up going and studying religion and philosophy. And it's amazing getting that opportunity to work just a little bit. Right. can tell you right off whether this is your calling or not. Right. So I remember I was a CNA one summer during oh, wow. uh, between high school and college, and I knew right away that was not the job I was to be in. Uh, so I would have loved the opportunity to explore ministry in a local congregation. Yeah. I, I got the opportunity to uh, intern as a, as a vet assistant, mm -hmm. and after being run over by cows two or three times, <laughs> I said, you know, this may not be the life for me. Gotcha. Uh, God has other plans oftentimes. So is, is there a specific s story within your work that you can turn to and say, this is where I knew uh, God is working, maybe in the life of an individual or a candidate of some kind? Can you, can you point to one or two of those stories that you knew? Sure. So we have the opportunity to visit our seminary students uh, each year and to sit down with them and, and just talk about where they are in the process. And when we're sitting and having a conversation with them and just hearing the energy and enthusiasm uh, that they have about answering their call and serving the church is just a really fresh reminder of this is why... I do the work that I'm doing. Mm. And for me, it has totally been a reevaluation of my own call. Like I said earlier, it was a call to a local church. Uh, but the coach that I had, had worked with recently gave me some great words that, that I was helping to give birth to other people's calling. Mm. And so the things that bring me energy and excitement are when I have the opportunity to hear somebody's call and how they're beginning to live that out. It's just really, really exciting. Uh, there's a lot of energy that comes from uh, watching the mentors. I have the opportunity to train all the mentors that work with our varied folks in different places and different times and, and just hearing the passion that the mentors have for walking alongside of someone as they discern is also something that's just really exciting to me. That's great. So let's talk about you. Uh, your call, you, know, you talked about having a coach. Where are you being stretched right now in ministry? Uh, what, where, where are your growing edges? Sure. So I am a mother, a wife, and a mother of three girls. Uh, life for me is all about balance and all about juggling. And so th the stretching place for me in ministry is that there's always more things that need to be done, more things that I want to do. Uh, but I really am a firm believer that uh, I have a deep calling to be a wife and a calling to be a mom. And that there's sometimes that the, the things of my job and the things of my work um, have to, to, to take a, a hold or a step back uh, in order to live out that calling. And so I continue to be stretched in that. For instance, yesterday was a snow day. Mm. I had a full day planned of, of work, things that I needed to accomplish, things that I needed to do, but I had three little girls at home. Um, and so plans quickly changed and I can were stretched and rearranged. Um, so I, I think that balance and, and figuring out how to, to navigate the world of, of all of my callings uh, is, is always going to be a challenge. Uh, I think it's a challenge for any of us. Yeah. I, I, and there's not a one of us that does ministry that there aren't enough hours in the day or hours in the week to get the job done. Right. Um, but none of us are any good if we don't have balance in our life. Right. And so, um, you know, in, in my technological world, I'm sitting there with email open all the time. Um, I have to say, I'm just not going to respond I'm to that. I'm off right now. I'm off at the moment. And so, you know, the next couple of days, I'm going to be on retreat at 
uh, Belmont Abbey at the monastery uh, just because I need some time for me. Mm-hmm. And yes, there may be some breaking news that will happen, but uh, I don't think the monks have as much technology as I would <laughs> like. I don't, yeah, I don't think so. So it will be an interesting um, thing, but I, I think that everybody in ministry uh, is dealing with that issue of balance. Mm-hmm. I think you're right. And so um, I can remember in my, my first appointment, I, Fridays were my day off, and I had to learn to write the word off on my calendar. If I didn't, I was real, uh, it was easy for me to, oh, sure, I'll go to lunch with you. Oh, sure, I'll be at that meeting. Uh, I had to, to learn that that was off. Right. Not that emergencies didn't happen. Right. I don't know I how many funerals something. I did on my day that's, off. Well, that's right. But uh, the, the thing is, is what are you going to do the next day? Are that's you going right. to take some time off? Right. Um, and eventually, uh, uh, we all have to find that balance in ministry. So... Um, what does the future of the United Methodist Church look like? That's something I've tried to ask all my guests in some form sure. or fashion. And you're sitting here in a, with a little different insight. Mm-hmm. Uh, what does the future look like? Well, as a product of the United Methodist Church, I have a deep love for this denomination. And I happen to believe that we have a lot of really great people, both lay and clergy, who are excited about this denomination and passionate about helping lead us into the future. So uh, I am really excited about some of our our seminary students or some of our candidates who are exploring ministry who have new and creative ideas about how to live out uh, being a United Methodist in Western North Carolina in 2015 and beyond. And it might look different Hmm. than it looks today in 5, 10, and 20 years. But I have absolute confidence that those uh, gifts and passions that have been placed on people's hearts and lives will help bring something wonderful into fruition. Um, It is my deep hope (laughs) that our denomination uh, continues to thrive um, and that we continue to be a real presence because we have something to offer this world in our understanding of grace. And I hope that my girls will grow up to be proud United Methodist uh, because they have received a foundation that has taught them about God's love and God's grace. Uh, No doubt. And, and, yeah, this is something that we're all dealing with and that, you know, what does the future look like? I, I've, you know, still got 15 years before retirement, mm-hmm. but it's also the thing that uh, um, there are some folks out there that are just beginning and what the church is going to look like 30 years from now. Um, I just hope that I can pave the way mm-hmm. and, and get out of the way. 90 mm-hmm. seconds. You know, that's one of the things that I'm, uh, trying to live my ministry to do is to get out of the way and and be ready for a future that I have no idea about. And it's okay. Right. It might okay. be a little scary to those of us who've been around. Right. Uh, but what great things God can do if we allow ourselves to get out of the way. Yeah. Well, we're just about out of time. It's a fascinating thing. Uh, 30 minutes seems like a long time on the clock, but when you're on radio, it doesn't take 60 long. 60 seconds. So you have one closing statement in 30 seconds. What, what do you want to give Western North Carolina today? So I hope that Western North Carolina will live into God's calling and that whether that be uh, to be a passionate layperson or a devoted clergy person, that you will do what it is that God has asked you to do. Very nice. Well, thanks for giving your time today, Sally, and and thanks uh, for being on the show. Thanks for having me. And thanks, everyone, for listening to us on Blog Talk Radio. This show will be available as a podcast on our Blog Talk page, on our iTunes page, as well as uh, on our umconnect.info page, and you can keep up with us there on Facebook and Twitter. So we're going to be back next week connecting United Methodists and their stories. Thanks to our sponsors, the Western North Carolina Conference and the United Methodist Foundation of Western North Carolina. You can find out more about them on the sponsors section of the website, umconnect.info. I'm Michael Rich, and you've been listening to Connect.